Cameron, Project Manager with Hensel Phelps, and Mish Ello, Customer Success Manager at Autodesk. Um, so if you'll just tell us a little more about yourself, Nemo, we'd love to hear about what you're doing there at Amazon. Awesome, awesome. Just before we start, um, um, I think uh, on the LinkedIn, uh, they're waiting for the broadcast. Um, and it's not showing there. So Gabriella, if you can check on that part before I start. Okay. Okay, now we are live. Yeah, we're awesome. live. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Jeff Yoders. Um, welcome to Construction Trends 2022, a dispatch from the future of construction. We're going to talk about the, the biggest trends we see in construction in the coming year, the adoption rate for technologies like robots, IoT, and AI to combat persistent labor shortage challenges, the role of more sustainable construction practices and how they'll be tackled in the coming year, and the role of technology and how it impact everything from worker safety to project profitability and outcomes. Um, we're going to have some clear strategies that can be implemented next year or in the coming year that the audience can put in practice right away. So um, I'm going to welcome our panelists now. We have with us Nima Jafari, Senior BIM Manager at Amazon, Andrew Cameron, Project Manager with Hensel Phelps, and Mejd Elo, Senior uh, Customer Success Manager at Autodesk. So uh, just tell us a little about yourself, Nima. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, my name is uh, Nima Jafari. I'm a Senior Manager um, for BIM in uh, Amazon. Um, before that, I was working in the GC and um, um, construction companies and architecture company. I work on the project like Second Avenue, Subway, um, Hudson Yard, uh, Grand Central, uh, Eastside Access. And um, I'm really be um, happy to be here with you guys. Yeah. How about you, Andrew? Tell us, how are things at Hensel Phelps? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Um, so I've been with Hensel Phelps a little over 12 years. Um, started my career with the uh, company back on the East Coast in our Mid-Atlantic division. Uh, worked on a few different kinds of projects, um, you know, federal, uh, mission critical, hospitality. Um, had the opportunity to inter um, internship on the Pentagon renovation. And then have been out here on the West Coast um, helping our Northern California team on a lot of aviation jobs. So, yeah, looking forward to the discussion. And uh, Mej, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you've seen construction change at Autodesk over your time there? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, so everybody, very, very nice to uh, have everybody here today. My name is Mej Dello, as Jeffrey mentioned. Um, I've been lucky enough to spend most of my career in the field in construction operations, working for a global VC. Uh, but today, as a customer success manager, I get to be the voice of our industry to continue to advance our construction technology by being a trusted advisor and customer advocate at Autodesk. So we'll definitely dive into the, the different views from being in the, in the field and now being on the technology side for our industry. Yeah. Our first question is, uh, we've seen a lot of change in the past two years for construction. Um, the industry has historically been referred to as a technology laggard, um, but many contractors across the globe now realize that they have to turn to technology to help with some of the micro and macro challenges they face today. Um, what's really going to move the needle in 2022? Yeah, Jeff, great prompt. Um, I think on the job site um, for the customer, um, you know, physically on the site, you know, what will really show a lot of change coming up will be some more adoption and greater access to kind of like prefab technologies and just mm -hmm. that overall workflow. However, in the office, I think really what will help us, you know, as a, you know, construction team is, you know, the ability to, you know, better quickly harvest, you know, some information, um, you know, job site KPIs. Uh, but more importantly, be able to like quickly digest it um, internally, whether it's with our stakeholders on the owner side um, or even our construction team to make you know quicker, you know, more informed decisions. Yeah, it seems like the, the amount of data is just growing, right, Andrew? Very true. And now we're getting a lot, you know, we're getting lucky as a you know consumer base, um, like you said with robotics, uh, the ability to go harvest data now can be you know semi-autonomous. Uh, you don't have to send your staff out there to collect all these inputs. 
Um, but you do need to be ready, um, certainly as a job site and a company, to understand what to do with it um, once it comes in. Who needs to, you know, reference it? Who needs to check it? Um, and again, like, you know, how long is that, you know, information valid for? You know, it could be something that we can trust for the next week. Um, or it could be something very acute where it's like, okay, this is like, you know, that week or that uh, one particular hour. Yeah. As a major owner, Nima, um, how do you start implementing new technology? You know, is this something you, you work with with your contractors um, project to project or? Yeah, great question. Uh, it is not an easy journey. Let's just start from that. And um, um, it needs kind of like some uh, some kind of like understanding uh, psychology of the people that you're working with, um, what process is already in the place and what is the best software. Just to summarize that, it's going to be on the three pillars. It's going to be people. That is the most you know important part. Uh, construction is, you know, people industry. You're working with the actual humans <laughs> mm -hmm. as, as 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 much as andrew want to like implement robots uh in the construction in the end of the day you're working with actual people and uh, you know if you're implementing new technology and kind of like making new pain or something that they should learn or you know you know, more click that there you're asking them to do, you may lose them in the like a three, third click. You know what I mean? It mm -hmm. goes to first click, they're already lost. Um, so um, again, working with people, second part is going to be the process. You should understand what is the process of the um, that team or our organization, how they're actually doing this stuff right now. And if you are suggesting a new implementation, a new technology, what's going to result for them. So it's like a, you know, um, pain and gain. Okay. You're giving them some pain, learning new software, new technology, you know, um, applying to the new um, kind of like cloud base or uh, new kind of uh, platform to go into. So what advantages they're going to get? And is it going to be, you know, tomorrow, next week, or it's going to be a long-term advantage. And that is one of the, you know, issues that we are having, you know, they want to implement Beam and we're going to tell them, hey, you're going to save 40% of the time, 30% on the cost. And um, after, you know, three, four months, your manager come to you and say, hey, you know, we spent actually more money. We didn't see any cost effectiveness. What is going on? So that is very important to understand the process and what you want to implement. And the third part is the right tool and right software. If you just bring the software in and new tools without thinking about integration and how it can help your company and what you see it in five years or 10 years, then it's going to be just, um, you know, another tool on top of another tool. So I think that three points is the more, uh, the most important point for the implementation. Yeah. Um, Mesh, uh, if you look at, you know, uh, the, the, all the stakeholders involved, you've got owners, GMs or uh, GCs or CMs, real estate uh, managers, you know, permitting authorities, there's a lot going on on any side, right? And you've really got to keep everyone in that loop, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of different, but yet a lot of the same, right? A lot of the processes are very similar. And really, the end goal is, is the same, right? Let's all get together and, and uh, contribute, collaborate to build a, a structure of, of some sort or another. And it really, like both Andrew and Nima have mentioned, it really does go back first and foremost to those people, right? It's it's We've been in the last year, and I know we'll dive more into this, but in the last year or two, we've been under so much uncertainty and that's not going away, right? So sure. first and foremost, we really need the people to be invested in a change, in a world that's continuously changing. That's quite stressful. So something that we're really targeting this year is to continue to have our ears closer to the industry and listen deeper to what the gaps truly are. Because if we're able to really identify those gaps, then we're actually, we're not enforcing a solution that's not, you know, the industry isn't ready for. We're going with the trend of what is actually in demand today. So, and a lot of that is, you know, we're focusing on the people, we're fo focusing on the process. So it's an individualized approach for those, all these different uh, parties that are part of this uh, big project, right? Yeah. So now audience, we'd like to turn to you. Um, you know, 
go on LinkedIn, give us your biggest trend you see for 2022, and we're going to use that uh, in our, our feedback session here. So um, go ahead. If you look back at 2021, the year that it was, uh, panel, uh, you know, what was the the biggest strategy you implemented in your firm? Um, you know, this is one where a year where everything was kind of unprecedented. So uh, how'd that go for you, Nima? <laughs> um, so um, for us in Amazon, it was, okay, you know, let's, let's see, you know, let's be realistic. You know, there's a COVID situation that's restrict lots of transportation to the sites. Um, there's a shortage of material, you know, uh, go and find it still right now. Good luck with that to build the, you know, your buildings. Um, and um, also um, it is like people being 100% remote most of the time and not having that communication and collaboration, you like face to face. Um, it's kind of like, um, led us to kind of go um, and work more on our processes, like looking back and see, okay, we were just, you know, going for expansion, going fast, 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 build more buildings, how to make it. Um, and we didn't think about is our processes are the best processes in the place, how we can do it better how we can do it faster, how we can automate that, and how we can connect those data that um, Andre was talking about in the last question. So I think the, the most important part for us was to pause, go back, check our processes, make them better, upgrade them, and connect those uh, part of the processes and workflow together. Andrew, uh, several people in the chat have said uh, that drones have been a game changer. Several, have, you know, picked up that technology here on, on SFO. Uh, you guys took that a little to to another level, really, with uh, with robotics. You know, doing a lot of that that capturing of images, right? Absolutely correct. Yeah, we were. Um, we definitely agree. I mean, the drone imagery that we're using on the job sites uh, early on, being able to link that back to. You know, in some cases, pre-existing GIS information uh, to really ensure that the site layout um, is the right fit, uh, so to speak, um, on the job site. Being able to address you know concerns for site logistics and access, and even to be able to better monitor things that were really hard to, you know, quantify, like earthwork moving and you know trench and excavation. Uh, but as SFO, we did have the good fortune of pairing with Boston Dynamics and Hollow Builder uh, to bring you know that semi-autonomous system into the job site. Again, drones are really great outside the job site and see how we can start to supplement the staff with you know, a workflow for dim um, image capturing and you know, try to give them a tool that makes their life a little easier for quality of life. Yeah. Another comment we're getting in the chat here is that uh, cloud-based construction strategy has really helped a lot of contractors out there. So. Mesh, do you have any uh, comment on that and how yeah. that's going? <laughs> Absolutely, especially in a year or two plus at this point of uh, not having the flexibility of, of being on site as much as we'd like to through a pandemic. I think we're relying a lot more on, on technology, on robotics, on, um, on the cloud, right, to house all of that data from all of our different technologies. And Unfortunately, though, I think, you know, we're we're in a world where, you know, we've got everybody's got their their smartphones. Right. And <laughs> we're bombarded with so much data. Right. Yep. Yours was just buzzing mm -hmm. a second. ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're bombarded by so much data that it's it's so hard to sift through and find, you know, what's good data and bad data that's just clouding our decision making. Right. So we're here at Autodesk, one of our biggest strategies that we we learned from from 2021 and really our, our history in our construction industry is how important the quality of the data is to be able to make you know wiser decisions, right? And and quicker decisions. Because a lot of times we're in those situations where you just we gotta act in that moment. So one of the biggest things I would say is helping remove some of those data silos, right? The cloud is just harvesting all of that in one location. And one of the biggest strategies has been a unified platform, right? That brings it all together mm -hmm. where 
you know, from, from my estimating to my model coordination, to the actual project management, to the, you know, field operations, all really connected in one, under one platform, um, just like it really is in the real world, right? The structure isn't separated. The, the prefab is not necessarily separate than the structure. So it's all really connected. So how do we, how do we bring it all together is, is really the you know, mentality that we're, we're targeting is that unified kind of platform and removing some silos. Uh, but again, I'm going to go back to people and culture. We can teach people the button clicks, right? We can teach people the mechanics of a platform and the, and the workflow, et cetera. But if that individual is not present mm -hmm. or willing to take that on, we're not moving anywhere, right? Especially sure. in a world of where we're under so much stress of constant change, constant uncertainty. So it's really something that we we really do need to get closer to the people and really continue to grow this our construction culture of of listening, of really understanding, okay, what are the true roadblocks? Is it truly a process issue? Is it a technology issue? Or is it you know, an, an adoption uh, focus where we can focus on the people, focus on what the true roadblocks and, and gaps are in that. So, yeah, definitely removing some silos, focusing on a more unified, um, you know, clean, good data, as we say, and, and absolutely the people, always the people. Yeah. And that data part of it, I wanted to ask Andrew, um, you know, Taking a hundred thousand images for SFO and managing it, that required some programming, some algorithms, and that's you know how you how you curate that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we definitely knew at the beginning uh, we couldn't use a legacy system. Um, you know, the whole point file system or a folder tree would be exhaustive, and you know, being able to go to one folder for the year, for the month, for the you know area, it just you know. You know, natively, that's not how we as people like interact or reference the job site. We don't talk about the job site in subfolders. Mm -hmm. So we were really looking um, fairly open at the beginning. I mean, this is back in like 2017 with how could we do it? How could we map truly, you know, the area of the job site with the information we're taking, you know, over the course of five years? And um, yeah, the Hollow Builder platform, you know, really allowed us to, again, truly link uh, the information so that way when not really for us but for the stakeholders you know when the architect when the uh, facilities maintenance team when the owner themselves you know wants to see like hey how are we doing here do we have enough time to make a decision or a change they could go to the area that they're familiar with on plan view click in you know, rewind back in time or look at the present and you know in five minutes they can see it versus having to crawl through a um, bunch of thumbnails or subfolders and you know again back to Mesh's point on you know moving to you know a unified cloud you know platform it is great because now you have access you're not restricted on inbox size or file transfers um now really what's important to nema's you know earlier mentioned was how is it called you know what you know attributes what file names what you know uh, reference you know fields are we using so that way when I'm looking for something, I'm looking for something in the same way that you know my counterpart would label it, or another stakeholder. Yeah, Nima, I imagine you're looking at things differently in 2022 than than going into 2021. Was you know, a, as an owner, uh, scaling up was very important to Amazon at that time. Right now, uh, how has that changed? Um, yeah. So. Um... As I mentioned uh, in last questions, you know, uh, uh, it was the priority for expansion and like, you know, mm -hmm. um, feeding our customers because as you know, you know, the uh, Amazon company is very, very um, customer, you know, center um, mm -hmm. company. So they were like, okay, what we should do to give the packages, for example, to you in two hours or, you know, two days, you know, we need to, you know, build more buildings and expand that. And, you know, in the time of the COVID, lots of us didn't want to go to the, you know, actual store or mall for the shopping so there were like lots of like requests coming in so we needed to satisfy those needs um and um thanks to god we were successful for that but now it's like kind of like 
as I mentioned, is getting to the time. Okay, we spend lots of time on like, you know, fire drill, you know, build all of this building, you know, and expand. Now let's look at it, how we can do this process better. Um, how we can, as um, um, Andre says, and Mej was talking about, about the good data, clean data, how we can harvest those data and why we are harvesting that. You know, we are talking about like AI, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, but nobody really talking about, okay, you're harvesting this data, what you're doing with this data? And like, I get this question. Um, and how the machine learning is going to work for you to kind of like give you um, um, prediction for future for your risk uh, with your subcontractor. For example, you have a subcontractor, he's always late in the projects, but you know, in the next project or you know, different CM is looking at them, they don't know about it. But if you have that data inside, for example, Construction Cloud has a part for that, it's called Construction IQ. It's gonna tell mm -hmm. you, hey, you know, you put the schedule, but this subcontractor is always late one month. So that is like the risk that you're gonna see. Or um, in our buildings, we were like, you know, uh, having lots of building that we were building, fulfillment center, robotic center in the different areas. Okay. Um, with that information, can we estimate our next building, you know, that in Arizona is getting built? That is where AI is coming to the play. That is where the clean data that Mesh was talking about. You know, in the past, it was taking us two months to estimate, you know, that big, uh, you know, uh, fulfillment yeah. center and project. But with the clean data and AI, I can do it in five seconds. So that is the part we're going to work more in 2022. All right. Well, uh, this is our final question before we'll get to some from the, the audience here. We have Q&A at the end. But um, um, how do you think technology will impact your 2022 strategy? Um, you know, what, what do you think is going to be the, the big thing that helps you through this year? Mayor, uh, why don't you sure. take that one? Yeah. Or, yeah, definitely building on, on what I said. It's yes, let's first and foremost yes let's collect some data right whether it's robotics whether it's, it's ai let's make the technology work for us right and and with that i think where, where nima was kind of going with that is beginning to standardize right so that we can just kind of copy and paste and and repeat where we can obviously you know being strategic on on where we do that but so really it, for us for for 2022 the question is always how can we better support our customers? Amazon, HP, you know, and, and on and on with, with our number of customers. And maybe this is the engineer in me, but I always go back to, well, what's what's missing? What's not working? And, you know, what's the true root cause, right? And it really goes back to all that data, right? We have so much of that, uh, as we said, that, that bad data clouding our decisions, but First and foremost, we want to support our customers to create a formal data strategy, as we're calling it, that is going to give them confidence in their decision making. We're seeing that um, our most successful customers are those that have begun implementing this formal data strategy that's supporting them in stronger decision making. So that means we're, we're getting to that root cause of that issue or RFI. You know, we're regularly regularly reviewing a data set um, with a set of intervals for looking for that quality. So like Andrew said, if I'm inputting, you know, a subcontractor uh, company name and it's not capitalized, but Andrew capitalized it, here we are, it's not clean data anymore, right? Now we're having mm -hmm. multiple duplicates across the board. So being able to take the time to look at some of the monitor, some of those practices, um, at the time of collection and after use, right? So we're looking at best practices for our next project and next project, giving us that structure um, for a common data environment overall that that is, you know, again, it's clean and and can be replicated over over time. So so really, it's all about that coming back to the quality of the data to be able to drive wiser decision making and hopefully less rework for. Yeah, standardized data is important. Uh, we've had several comments here, uh, you know, about um, ISO standards and other things. And, you know, um, just putting it in is important, right, Andrew? 
putting it in the right way. <laughs> Absolutely. And again, for everyone that's, you know, kind of like, you know, joining us today on the uh, live session, I mean, there are a lot of point solutions out there and different strategies you can take. Um, but it is important, especially on the job site for the consumer to really remind yourself that, you know, along the way, it's really important to figure out like, all right, how does this help get the right information to the right people at the right time? Right. And for our, you know, kind of like 2022 look ahead strategy, you know, we're excited to start to you know, figure out again, from the job site level, what we can do with the day-to-day -day team. Um, our corporate team is certainly looking at, um, you know, what pain points are systemic across, you know, the industry that they can support, you know, top down. And for me, selfishly, you know, the, some of the technology I'm really looking forward to, you know, whether it's playing with or further expanding in this year to help get the right information to the right people at the right time. Um, certainly the robotics in the field, uh, seeing if we can get more reliable or predictive production time, um, whether it's for layout or for working place. And then also seeing if there's a, a way that we can eliminate some of the, what I feel are the smaller hurdles uh, to driving deeper AR uh, integration on the job site. Uh, so we have, you know, really awesome information. You know, the team does an amazing job, you know, building these federated models. You know, how can, you know, me as a project manager help our team, you know, empower them, whether it's with hardware or software, to get that out in the field sooner or easier to digest um, in those different types of mediums. So uh, those are kind of my selfish ones that I'm really hoping uh, <laughs> will start to kind of grow and be more commonplace in 2022. But um, yeah, we'll keep our fingers crossed, I guess. Yeah, Andrew. Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, just want to add one point to that. Like, as an architect, you know, you know, following the standard, it was my pet peeve. I was like, why should this line be, you know, <laughs> this thickness or this color or this? Ah, oh, I, I don't like it. You know what I mean? Uh, why should it be like that? This way is better. Or every company has their own standard. So, um, and you know, as VDC managers or people that we are harvesting data and lots of people on this call. I think it is very important to explain to our stakeholders and the people that we are talking why we need that standard. Because if you don't explain for them, again, it goes back to the people part that we were talking with Mage. It's just a pain. There is no advantage to that. You know what I mean? Why the name of our file should be, you know, like this, or why we should follow this ISO. You know, we can say, oh, it looks better or whatever. But the real reason it is, you know, we want to find that data and connect that data. You know, it's on a gonna go to the collaboration, coordination, and communication. This makes this three part easier, you know, in Beam that we are doing. And um, you know, just imagine you have you're you're making a foundation, okay? And you have that foundation item in your estimating, in your scheduling, in your change order, in your RFI, in your model. How you want to connect these all of these together when your estimating team is totally using, you know, Excel sheet, for example. You know, uh, it should be a way to connect them, you know, and maybe that way is you know using CSI or Omni, you know, the the codes, you know, the unified code that connect all of them together. And when you want to find that file to connect it to or that information, if you don't have a standard and somebody just, you know, save it as final schedule one, 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 one in your folder, you never can find it. So I just want to make sure that we explain it for people why we need a standard and what is the advantage of that. So people just don't look at it as something that we are just trying to be, you know, um, you know, um, make them to do something that is time consuming for them. So I just wanted to add that to um, Andre comment. Great point. And as a as an owner, um, you're you're thinking of using this data beyond the project, right? This goes to facilities management and ops and maintenance, doesn't it? Of course, of course. Uh, we call it dream team. We want to start, you know, from um, our real estate, you know, going to the, um, you know, composite design, conceptual design. 
assigned then to our site architect, uh, sustainability, uh, you know, change management, our robotic, our MHE, GCs, um, and also asset management, and for the future for the expansion um, and retrofits. You know, um, it is very important, like, you know, just like two weeks ago, there was a bad tornado and some of our buildings get, you know, damaged by that. So you should have all of those information ready for your, um, you know, um, retrofit and uh, the team that's going to go there and change your roof. You know, what kind of like equipment you had there that the wind just take it away? What kind of energy was there? You know what I mean? What mm -hmm. was uh, what was the capacity of that? And if you cannot have access to um, those data for some of the buildings that we have, like satellite buildings that we have, the data centers that we have in the second, you know, it's going to be a big, big problem. So it is very important to have all of those data ready. Yeah. We're going to take some. Go ahead, Bish. Sorry, Jeffrey, I was going to add, I, I love how you did that, Nima. You know, it's a very, very simple thing, just a naming convention, right, across multiple different parts of the project from the estimating to the actual, you know, facilities management down the line. But that's the big, you know, that t times, you know, 55,000 items that are being named on a job or whatever the number is, it's huge, right? That impact of just naming convention of a small yeah. item across the board. So, yeah. There's a, a question here. We're going to take questions from the audience now um, from Brenda Kozma Radmacher in the uh, on the chat here. You know, uh, she says one key consideration to keep in mind is how data impacts your risk management and risk mitigation. Um, you know, uh, do, do you keep all of it? Um, how does that? Uh, I guess I'll give you give you this one first. Nima is is that something you you think about going forward? Yeah, I, I, I give it kind of like example of that in what I was talking and it was about the schedule and risk management, for example, for a schedule. You know what I mean? You have a subcontractor in your past uh, project had a delay. So the risk manager part for that is going to tell you, hey, um, your deadline may shift or maybe that is not your you know, longest duration because this subcontractor could be wrong. Or for the safety, you know, based on the incidents that we are having and uh, we are using Construction Cloud for our safety. And, um, you know, um, if there is a... Um, subcontractor that has lots of like, you know, safety issues is going to give you the risk or the risk for, you know, RFIs that are open or change orders. Um, so you can harvest all of those data um, and, um, you know, use it in your future um, project because, you know, we are keep building the project. So, and lots of our subcontractor and contractors are the same you know, uh, companies. So learning from the past and kind of having a lesson learn is going to help you for the risk management part. Yeah. Andrew, yeah, would you like great. to add anything from the, the contractor perspective there? <laughs> yeah, I mean, when we start a project, you know, whether it's a you know hotel, whether it's a hospital, aviation, data center, um, we definitely, you know, at the beginning of the job do, you know, to Nima's point, look back and figure out, okay, you know, what's similar and kind of like, how do we want to judge ourselves? Um, I mean, for the people listening on the call, you can, you can track pretty much anything nowadays. And mm -hmm. it is really difficult um, fully admitting, you know, on the job site to figure out, okay, what is material to track for the future? And for us, you know, for labor, you know, it's always like, you know, how much time does it take to install something? And that seems to be the easiest translation from you know, region to region or project to project type, um, because, you know, maybe the efficiency rate is modified a little, and certainly the wage that is paid in each area modifies, you know, accordingly. But if you can really start to get down to that, again, time per widget, that absolutely helps. Um, but, you know, I think just like solving a maze, you know, if you as a team can whiteboard what information or decision points are important, you can then start to work that problem backwards and really start to quickly figure out, you know, what software solutions, what, you know, workflow modifications, if any, need to be made. So that way on the next job or the existing job, you are able to, you know, kind of take that, you know, slice in time and, you know, understand if you want, you know, data that's archived or if you want real time, quote unquote, information to make these decisions 
or if you want, you know, to Nima's point, you know, a projected forecast um, set of information to evaluate future um, outcomes. Yeah. This is a question that comes from an unnamed LinkedIn user. Um, they ask, uh, what are the perspectives from the group on increasing the role of DFMA, prefab, and industrialized construction? And we sort of talked amongst ourselves about this in one of our rehearsals, but um, prefab is you know important and it's only going to increase with the, the supply chain problems we're seeing, right? Yeah, and I've, on the job site, I think it goes back to what you know the group you know, reasonably touched on and hopefully resonates with the uh, people on the call is really making sure that both the vernacular that the team is talking about and also the rules that the team is, you know, approaching are consistent. So if the design team or the engineering team is operating with a set of rules that everything can be customized, and then that goes to the procurement team where they have to now go buy out customized widgets, and that needs to go to the factory floor or the warehouse to get assembled in a unique fashion, that really deters um, being able to really have these amazing white papers for successful prefab. Um, so for us, it's trying to get the right people in those rooms when we are making a decision in the model to you know, bring in the trades expertise and saying like, hey, this is what I can find, you know, to the example for structural steel shortages or, you know, bring them into the job site remotely, you know, with, you know, some of these cloud computing programs to show them, hey, this is the access. You know, we have to break it up into you know, components that can fit through a doorway, you know, to avoid rework. And I think as everyone start to finish, uh, gets more comfortable understanding why, you know, that person is asking for, uh, you know, an answer or why they cannot, you know, I guess, forfeit all of the amount of customization or tweaks they need uh, will really help shorten that gap between, you know, the decision being made, a prefabbed, call it, uh, solution mm -hmm. available, and then rolled out and installed on the job site. Yeah, um, this is a focus at Autodesk, isn't it, uh, Mish, to sort of For sure, especially enabling this? Yeah. <laughs> Especially looking at our different, you know, customers where you've got a GC that's that's looking at building a, a, a hotel where there's definitely some repetition there and a lot of potential for prefabrication. But then you've got, you know, a, a stadium that that is, you know, a lot of different kind of customization. Right. But um, with without a lot of that standard, I think I'm, I'm also kind of curious to hear with customers like uh, Amazon, Nima, for, for you all. There's a lot of repetition that I believe there's a lot more prefab involved. Uh, so it's very interesting from, from the Autodesk perspective to see the different customers utilizing prefabrication and, and such um, in different situations. But I'll add it to Numa. I think you, you've got a lot to say mm -hmm. here, too. <laughs> no, actually, it's a great question. You know, the first time that I was hearing from prefab and even modular buildings and everything, it was I think 15 years ago. And I was like, that is a great idea. It's save time, it's save energy. It is less noise in the city. It's like making the quality of the life, you know, going higher. And now 15 years after, of course it growed, but it wasn't to what I was expected. So I was thinking about it and maybe I'm wrong, but when I'm looking at like what we are doing in Amazon, from what I see, it's the, the problem is not in the prefabrication or the module. It is about how we start the project. You know, most of these projects are starting with the design and there's an architect designing them, you know, and now we want to add kind of like the prefab part into the, you know, system. And these two doesn't work with each other really good from what I see. So um, what we are doing in Amazon is like, okay, if you have a building and it has a core and shell and structure, okay, um, the part inside of it, you know, we have a um, bathrooms, we have uh, classrooms, we have, uh, you know, robotic center, this and that. And proportionally, it could change if our, you know, project get bigger or, or smaller. So uh, you can come up with the kind of the ratio of that um, changes. So you're going to have a, a very good idea, even before design, um, how big your bathroom or how many bathrooms you're going to have on the project that is not even designed. 
Okay, so I call it like uh, um, part and pieces, or uh, you know, a kind of like modular design. So if you start your design based on that modular design, or dynamic design, or parametric design, whatever you want to call it, you know, and then have the families, you know, smart families that is based on those spaces of the ratio of your program then that is the good part for a starting point for the prefab and modular design. And that is something that we are working on to implementing it for all of our uh, project. Um, so yeah, I think there is a starting point that all of us is missing. And I'm sure in future, that's gonna be future of the construction, you know, understanding mm -hmm. what you have, you know, before that. And it's going to come in the, from the day that you're in Naviswork or Revit, you're pressing a enter, and there's a 3D printer building your building for you, most of it. I mean, it's out there. You guys saw the videos, I'm sure. Concrete, and, yeah. yeah, and that is the industry where it's going. You know, you want to work with the legacy, you know, kind of platforms and everything. It's going to go away. <laughs> so um, that is the future of the building, if I want to summarize it. One of our uh, audience members, Kim Schwickrath, from said that Planet Fitness is where she works is started using prefab items for their new clubs. So thank you for adding that. Um, one other question I wanted to hit on here for, came from Neil Gordon. Uh, Neil asked, um, "You know, AR will well, this is a comment. And then there's a question. AR will be the final step of connection of the model to the field, and finally get get us close to true coordination." Um, you know, we talked a bit about AR. Um, you know, it's it's very powerful for construction. Um, do you think that's true that it's the final step to to model a field connection? Um, you guys want to go and answer that question, mm -hmm. or yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, go, ahead go on, Andrew. On. Um, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, I, I I think you know it is very very important. Like um, AR. Um, is the part that we are lacking in the construction, you know? And I work with that, and people that used it, they loved it. I don't think the technology is there one hundred percent right now, you know, with the Hololens and Hololens two, it is getting there. But the technology for supporting what we exactly want in the site, I feel, is not there yet. You know, it has lots of like background work. Yeah, you can see and connect, you know basically your point cloud and your augmented reality with your model and you can see it side by side, but it has lots of like pre-work behind that. That, you know, in future with, uh, you know, coordinate system, uh, you know, connecting your actual model um, to the augmented reality automatically and everything is gonna go away. So just imagine you're a project manager, you're in the morning coming to the site, okay? And you just put your HoloLens and there's a subcontractor there that's saying, oh, I wanna take that uh, rack of conduit from here to here. You're gonna put your HoloLens on and you're gonna say, oh no, it's gonna be two docks there, there's a HVAC there, you cannot do that, you know, go back to the coordination, you know, in the yeah. second, something that, you know, right now we are doing it, um, you know, in the field and one month after that, they're going to be a fight in the mm -hmm. <laughs> site, the subcontractor talking, that is my space, look at my model, look at my 2D drawings, and uh, that's going to go away in a second, with just looking at your site and what's going to get installed. So yeah. I can say I 100% agree with that comment that um, coordination and collaboration in future is definitely is going to be in the, you know, um, augmented reality. We've got about two minutes, so let's go to Andrew. Yeah. And just real quick, I mean, for me as a customer on the job site, I'm always really excited when I find a way to, you know, maintain a higher level of fidelity from the federated model to the job site. And if that's through like, you know, more detailed layout uh, measures through robotics, or whether that is through, you know, more spatial planning and forecasting with augmented reality. And, you know, certainly mm -hmm. as you know, hardware is getting better. I mean, like, you know, the tablets and the phones that are coming out have, you know, cameras and processors in there that can really, you know, leverage the, uh, you know, the LIDAR and the computer vision learning that, you know, is needed to really successfully deploy this and kind of locate, um, you know, what you're looking at relative to what was already designed. And it's going to be, you know, all of us, you know, on this LinkedIn live event that keep demanding and asking for these, you know, small measured um, improvements to hopefully make 2023, you know, more of that reality um, than we have today. 
Yeah, and that's a great place for us to stop because we're out of time. But um, I'd like to thank uh, our panelists, Mesh Ello, uh, Nima Jafari, and Andrew Cameron. It's been a great discussion. And and thank you, our LinkedIn Live audience. We really got great questions. So um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. We hope you got as much out of this as we did. Pleasure. Bye, everyone.